Hello and welcome to the Mutual Fund Show. I'm Neeraj Shah. Over the next 22 minutes, we'll talk about crucial aspects about the mutual fund industry. I'll start off by talking about risk-adjusted returns. And Juzair, I'll start off with you first. Whether risk-adjusted return analysis can really help identify the right schemes for one's portfolio. Because when I look at over the last one year or the last three years, funds with the best returns versus funds with, let's say, risk-adjusted returns, depending on whichever parameter they might be choosing, the difference in returns is very stark. How do you approach this aspect, Juzair? So, first of all, uh, thanks, Neeraj, for having me on the show. And I think it's a excellent topic and something which uh, not most of the you know uh, investors look at uh, the risk adjusted return you know and specifically when right now we have a market which is you know more of greed and uh, less of fear so i believe that you know uh, looking at risk adjusted return is one of the most important parameter which one should look at in terms of uh, you know investing and i will just give you a very small example uh, we had a fund called, you know, HDFC Prudence Fund, which is now uh, HDFC Balance Advantage Fund. And it is comes under more as a dynamic asset allocation category where with nearly around 69 to 70 percent, uh, you know, uh, equity exposure. So balance is more of debt. And as we talk today, it's around 58 percent is in uh, equity and the balance is in uh, debt. It, in fact, it has outperformed uh, quite a number of, uh, you know, equity funds, huh? even in a three-year return category. So now you are talking of somebody who is only around 60%, uh, you know, in equity and balances in debt and somebody who is in a small cap fund or, a, you know, in fact, some of the broader base funds also are there and their return has been better. Hmm? Uh, then uh, even some of the equity funds. So this actually shows that uh, risk adjusted is something is some uh, what most of the investors need to look at. Uh, unfortunately, in the current market, uh, most of the investors are looking at uh, a higher, uh, you know, uh, return ratio in the top. Juzer, 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 may I yes. ask you how do you then how do you in your analysis identify risk? adjusted returns? I mean, what are the factors that you take? Um, and uh, for how long does a person need to hold on to these funds for them to give better returns than, than the absolute returns that are given by funds? So uh, no, ideally, we always look at a three-year time horizon for any Got investment, it. right? It has to be minimum three to five years is something what you should look at in any investment. And once you look at that, you uh, someone needs to be even comfortable. Like now, uh, when you look at some of the data points which we have looked at, uh, if you see Quant Small Cap, right? Now Quant Small Cap has given more or less the same return as a Franklin India Small Cap. But its uh, allocation to large cap is much higher than what is there to Franklin India small cap. The small caps will always react much more uh, than a large cap. Large caps are supposed to be slightly much uh, better, you know, in terms of the risk reward ratio, in terms of the safety. They will not uh, be volatile. So volatility is something what we look at. Uh, we look at the sharp ratio, and uh, this is something which I think not many investors look at. But I think they should start looking at uh, the sharp ratios of the funds and uh, look at funds which are, you know, giving a longish uh, return with a more consistent return rather than, you know, trying to uh, just keep on chasing uh, returns because we have seen over a period of time that funds keep on rotating, you know, sometimes some fund is doing well and then they're suddenly at the bottom. So it is better to be in a fund which is, you know, consistently in a maybe... Uh, Q1 or Q2 quartile. Hmm? So, and that's the place where the sharp ratios and, you know, your alpha ratios come into play. And uh, that's how we actually go about selecting the funds in terms of uh, what allocation an investor should have. And over a period of long run, we have seen that you always uh, revert to the mean. Okay. So, you, uh, if you have a three to five year time horizon, in short term, you may see very large returns. But over a three to five year uh, uh, time uh, time horizon, the investors will get us more or less the same return. So it's better to look at the risk factors itself also while investing. Mm. Okay. 
One on your view may be different. I would love to understand if you indeed think the same way that Jose does, or is your view different? Uh, actually, Neeraj, I would allude to what a lot uh, Javair has just mentioned, that it's really important to understand the risk-adjusted return that a fund manager and the fund has been able to deliver over a longer period of time. I think it's not really uncommon to see today also investors are come to fund which has delivered the highest trading or the bigger return over a one or one year or a three year period. And obviously it doesn't really help that we have been in a really polarized market over the last couple of years, rather really after COVID, where market seems to be moving singularly in one direction. And at that point in time, it could look like a futile exercise to you know talk about this, talk about you know downside protection, why it is important to look at this and a preservation of capital over shorter periods of time during when the markets are volatile, right? But this is exactly when actually investors could look at understanding the performance of the fund and the fund manager itself using a few ratios that we internally use to actually fit the fund. So a couple of the ratios that we there talks about are the Sharp and the Sortino ratio, which looks at the risk suggested return relative to the risky rate, which could be a one-year even. Right? Or also the information ratio, which looks at the risk adjusted return relative to the benchmark. So there could be scenarios where, let's say, there are two funds, fund A giving a 12% return, fund B giving a 14% return. On paper, at face value, investors would probably go with fund B giving a higher rate of return. But if fund B has assumed those returns by taking, let's say, an amount of risk, which is significantly higher than what fund A would have assumed, then maybe on a risk adjusted basis, fund A is a better fit. So again, there is no right and wrong answer. I think investors need to figure out for themselves that are this an important criteria when they are looking at funds. So let's say, uh, again, to give an example, someone who wants to protect the downside, fund which falls 30% in value needs to deliver a return in excess of 40% to get and uh, come at level head, right? So these are the things which we typically like to advise investors that always look at it from a risk point of view look at it from the downside protection point of view. And if you're comfortable taking on those kind of volatility in a longer term journey of your equity portfolio, then you're perhaps fine assuming that kind of thing. Mm. And viewers, I think this whole idea of looking at some of the key ratios, as difficult as it sounds, might actually hold you in good stead over a period of time. Uh, by and large, mutual fund investments have yielded returns. How to optimize those returns for the risk appetite that you have? is probably the reason. Remember, there is another school of thought which says that um, the higher returns have not necessarily come from looking for some of these ratios. But I think over a period of time, it may just even out as well. So that's the other thing you have to keep in mind. OK, now that's the first conversation done. Uh, maybe we'll do a slightly longer first segment and do queries in the second segment, because I also want to talk about the NFOs as they stand right now and what should people do. because. Uh, Varun, I'll start with you this particular piece. A barrage of NFOs open in the market currently, all of them high pitch marketing. Uh, we contribute to that by getting the NFO managers and talking about what is it that the NFO stands for and the confidence portrayed by the fund managers. But usually I've seen advisors, RIAs, distributors say that NFOs may not be the best option. Now, but because there are so many of them, I'd love to understand from you first. Is there any out of the six or seven that are open right now or open in the next one week and open for the next three day, three weeks, is there any that you are keenly watching out for? Why so? So, Leo, I'll answer that in a two-part question. First, to your question with respect to whether investors should look at NFOs. And obviously, there is a school of thought which will immediately tell you that avoid NFO at all costs. You do not have any information about the fund the fund manager, how it is going to perform, how it has performed over the last uh, 12 months, 18 months, right? But we look at NFOs in a couple of ways, and there is a strict framework that we look at, right? So today, the NFOs that are coming out in the market are, let's say, either falls in two categories. One is being launched by fund houses to fill their product shelf. And I talk about filling the product shelf, that typically means looking at filling diversified equity funds. So Franklin is coming up with a multi-cap fund since there was a CF product gap that they had in the portfolio. That is one uh, uh, chain of NFOs that are coming out in the market. And the second is the more sectoral and the thematic NFOs, which is obviously a bit more challenging to play. You need to have understanding of the sector itself. Uh, you need to be able to get the timing, the entry and the exit right, the valuations right, so on and so forth. 
So we look at it from a couple of ways. Number one, when we are looking at an investor portfolio, we work first see whether there is and is it structured in a manner that there is a clearly a space for that kind of sectoral or a thematic NFO in place. That's number one. And number two, once there is a place for that NFO, then we dive deeper into whether that sectoral or a scheme is going to play out in the next 12 to 18 months, typically a shorter to a medium play because these things tend to play in cycles, right? So the current crop of NFOs that we are seeing, roughly six or seven of them, one of them which actually stands out to us is the Tata Nifty India Tourism Index. This, again, is a theme that is catching on uh, to the market. There are no really fund houses that have launched uh, NFOs in this category. And there are two to three reasons why actually we like uh, the people behind launching a fund focused on travel and tourism. Number one, it is a fast-growing industry. Post-COVID, what we saw about 2019 numbers, it is a $190 billion industry, which is supposed to grow at 8 to 9% and reach close to $450 billion by FY2033. Uh, FY2033, that's number one. Number two, we can see from the current administration point of view, there is a significant cut on infrastructure. The government was, wants to build new airports. It wants to upgrade the existing airports. It is doubling out the rail network. It is upgrading the road network itself, right? So all of these have linkages with the travel and the tourism industry because if it is easier to get from point A to point B, obviously people tend to travel more. And number three is the expanding middle class. We Indians are aspirational customers. As and when our basically pocket share goes, we like to go and spend on experiences that includes uh, maybe taking a first uh, uh, airline flight that includes sure. going out, eating in restaurants, so on and so forth. So these are the few reasons why we actually like this uh, NFO that is coming out in the market. But again, our advice to investors would be to see whether this is a good fit into your portfolio hmm. and do not pile on to so much of the NFO just because there is a high fever pitch around sales and marketing because there is always the risk that by the time you enter into a segment, so much of the story would have already played out yeah. and there would not really be a lot for you to uh, catch on by the time you enter. Got it. Remember, US first of its kind NFO simply because the index got created maybe three weeks back or thereabouts and they've been first off the stable. The other thing to do, viewers, might be that you might want to um, see in your existing mutual fund schemes what kind of exposure does it have to stocks which could potentially fall into this tourism uh, pocket, if you will, uh, and, and, and then try and take a call. Josair, what would your view be? I mean, a, out of the multiple NFOs open, is there something that you guys at Ventura are recommending people to invest into? Well, so I think first of all, we need to understand that now uh, most of the fund houses don't have any categories left out. So the only place where they have got to play is the thematic funds, right? So uh, it's like, and the second thing what we are doing is that we are moving much more, uh, the investors are moving on to a much more riskier, uh, you know, a category because you're moving from a, more generic fund to a riskier investment. So that is something uh, which someone needs to bear in mind that uh, these products are mainly for somebody who has already invested in the market. He has, you know, been in the large cap, mid cap, small cap space, and then he's going to be looking at a thematic or a, a sectoral fund. So it's, uh, and I, I think the more important has been is that everybody is, you know, uh, looking at that how HDFC defense fund has given a return and everybody feels that that's a new bandwagon uh, to be looked at. So at one side, one has to be extremely careful because from a risk profile matrix, uh, this is on the highest scale of the risk uh, where you would be uh, you know, investing. Uh, these are all new age. Yes, some of them do look good, like how uh, Varun also mentioned that you know, tourism and uh, you know, uh, is also catching up in India and uh, because the per capita is also going up for and people will want to spend money. So that as, as a team also looks good. Even the energy team looks good of ICSA Prudential. So uh, because you will consume energy, uh, whatever we may do. So whether it is, you know, the fossil or the new age, uh, renewable energy. So these are the two which look good. But unfortunately, I believe that, you know, the whole trend, in fact, if you look at the even last three months collections of mutual fund, nearly 50% of the money is actually going into the thematic uh, space. And I think uh, that is something where uh, we are not very, very comfortable. I think, uh, I hope it is not the new investors who are going 
into these funds uh, because they should actually be into the broader based categories and uh, thematic is for somebody who is actually a little bit of a you know a veteran in the mutual fund investments uh, that is what i would look at got it okay um, and that too is fair advice by the way uh, there is a query that has come in um, and and that is particularly on the one nfo that uh, is on right now which varun spoke about which is the tourism index i think mehul gupta it is who is asking that is the new travel and tourism index a good space to invest in looking to invest in the tata nifty india tourism index nfo well mehul i think you got your answer uh, from uh, from varun about this nfo but keep in mind i think what juzair said and i think something that varun would varun would probably on uh, you know also say a yes to is that it depends on maybe what's the kind of investments that you already have within your portfolio a thematic fund is a good addition to a satellite portfolio typically try, if you try and follow core and a satellite portfolio approach a thematic fund might fall within there but varun's answer which he just gave about 2 3 minutes back is a good example of an answer to your query so i hope that helps you german we have a few queries and we should uh, i'll tell my producers to try and pull up some of these queries to see if we can get answers to them so mahendra agarwal um his age 30 uh the the question is uh, that uh, is there any rationale for continuing investment in parag parik funds since they do not invest outside that much any war okay jose i'll come to you first on this uh, maybe parag parik got the edge because of the global investing but now rules don't allow them to do it as much should one continue doing that or should one look at other options no 100% you should continue there's no point in you know you trying to uh, jump from one place to another uh, it, it can you know start off investing at any point of time and uh, the best advantage which they have is that uh, you have a they can always invest uh, internationally 35% whenever the limit opens up so uh, and your taxation still remains intact so in my opinion you should continue in fact uh, parag parag is the only one who has all the categories still available because he has only one flexi cap category so uh, they they have taken a stand of you know not having any other uh, categories just concentrating on one category so i think you should continue with this fund okay um uh okay so that's uh, the first query to watch out for uh, is your thought any different varun uh no not really anyways i would probably allude to what zubair had just mentioned right i mean today still i mean from if if an investor is also looking at from an international diversification point of view the fund, the fund still holds about 15% of the securities across four to five stocks in the united states right so it is not that they are not having any sort of an exposure to international markets it's just that due to regulations they are not able to do so but once basically the tap opens up i think they'll be uh, they, they'll be able to go that route but not just looking at from an international investment point of view but just the general philosophy um, around uh, how uh, parag parik and raji sarkar uh, manages this fund is much more appealing rather than just the international the international piece okay the second query is from shubham mehta uh, age 36 uh, and Shubham's goal is kids education he says that i have a newborn baby i want to invest for her education is it advisable to start a mutual fund for it i want to do an sip investment for 2000 to 2500 rupees how long should i remain invested i'm sure the answer is a yes but varun i'll start with you on this so so shubham absolutely i think mutual funds are the best long term wealth creation vehicles i think the biggest advantage that you have is that you have time by your side if you're nearly taking a 16 to 18 year view for your newborn baby Uh, right, uh, you need to just invest small sums of money to be able to get your education. So, what we advise here would be to, uh, if you're looking at a roughly 18 year horizon, at which point in time your uh, kid will go off for education, whether uh, will go off for college, whether in India or abroad. But look at investing in equities for the next 16 to 17 years, maybe a bunch of diversified equity funds. And as and when you know your goal, uh, which is towards the year 18. Roughly about 12 to 18 months before that, slowly and gradually via a systematic withdrawal plan, start removing some exposure from equity uh, and uh, do an SIP into debt fund so that your capital is protected and whatever you have invested over the 16 to 18 year period, your wealth is intact. So you do not get caught in the uh, wrong cycle of the market. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the quest for taking one more query, I'll skip the this question to you, Juzair, and ask you yet another query that is coming from Sayan Ghosh. 
age 27. Um, Sayan is asking who verifies the performance indicators like uh, beta, sharp ratio, and standard deviation reported by mutual funds. Is it possible that they may be manipulating it to look good? Can these numbers be trusted? So, uh, uh, you know, uh, manipulation can be done anywhere, right? I mean, so uh, if you are equipped enough to calculate your own sharp ratio and uh, so maybe you can, you know, look at some of the independent uh, websites are there, uh, like you have, you know, value research, you have money control, many of them also do calculate, uh, Morningstar is there. Uh, maybe you can, you know, if you are so keen, you can even subscribe to some of those uh, uh, packages. So, uh, and in fact, uh, by the way, most of the mutual funds also actually outsource this uh, functionality. And uh, since they are very well regulated by SEBI, I don't think that anybody is, you know, uh, looking at uh, uh, manipulating uh, any of this, uh, uh, you know, all the things, the ratios, you know. So I don't think that uh, uh, you should uh, have that type of a doubt in your head. Got it. Uh, Got it. You should look at, you know, how they are performing and, you know, in fact, mutual fund industry is one of the most transparent most, where sure, the sure. entire portfolio is available to you immediately within the first week got itself. It. Got it, got it, got it. And and that's a fair point. Okay, gentlemen, out of time completely. Thanks so much for joining in today on the Mutual Fund Show. Really appreciate your time. And viewers, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thanks for tuning in to this leg of the Mutual Fund Show.